I can't think of a more appropriate subtitle than The Forgotten Sands for the last major Prince of Persia adventure Ubisoft ever released. There's a couple of reasons for this, but chief among them is that I get the feeling most, ironically, misremember what this was all about or just plain forgot. Maybe you have, like, a hazy, dreamlike memory of seeing dozens of 360 and PS3 copies floating around in a bargain bin in the back of your mind. Oh, uh, wh wh wait, this was just a, a remake, right? Yeah, of Sands of Time? Because it got released alongside the movie. N no? Wait, no, we're not- we're dumping the characters in the world of the last game now! No, this is- this is a completely new thi- wait, wait, every version is different? What the fuck is it? Obviously, Ubisoft didn't go about explaining what the Forgotten Sands was with any degree of clarity, and I still think there's some confusion over just how massive an undertaking and a gamble this all was. That sadly didn't pay off. We have a lot of different titles to cover here, so to save some time and tension, I'll spoil my own video and say that the idea of re-rebooting your series to coincide with a movie based on your series, but simultaneously making a bunch of different prequels, was a mistake. This tanked Prince of Persia for all intents and purposes. Across six different SKUs, it was just barely able to move 100,000 units in May of 2010, which is pretty fucking terrible, but not surprising since Ubisoft decided to release it less than a week before a few other smallish titles that they couldn't possibly foresee affecting their sales. Uh, just Red Dead Redemption, Alan Wake, and You Are Mr. Gay too. I guess the Ubi suits really thought the marketing synergy of releasing alongside the movie's premiere was enough to combat the release of a Rockstar open world game and fucking Mario. Ah, uh, God bless their pure little moronic marketing hearts. Now, that's another thing. With this re-reboot pre-sequel, a fair amount of series purists didn't necessarily want to go back to the universe that had already been wrapped up. Casuals had no interest in buying what they perceived to be a shallow movie cash grab, and to top it all off, Pop Zero wasn't even two years old yet. This was a bumblestorm of bad marketing and worse timing that was destined to fail, even if the Forgotten Sands games were five-star classics. Which they are not. So, without further ado, let's head into the storm full-on and try to make sense of one of the more confusing releases in the series history. Like mentioned before, there are six different versions of Forgotten Sands. One for the PC that uses <laughs> you play. One for the 360, then we have the PS3, the Wii, the DS, and bringing up the rear, the PSP. Now, we're gonna circle one branch over here, uh, encompassing the PC, PS3, and 360, as was the style at the time in the late aughts. These all tell a tale that somehow takes place after Sands of Time, but before Warrior Within? Remember there was that 10 year gap between the two? Yeah, so somewhere in here, the prince just goes on happy little adventures in his happy little world. Oh, but watch out, prince! The Dahaka is chasing you! Grrr. Oh no, the prince is taking his sweet time and doesn't seem to be worried about Mr. Dahaki at all. <laughs> what happened? Well, it's fine, because the Dahaka doesn't even seem to exist and is never mentioned once. So, does this take place between the two? Is this post Two Thrones? Ah, uh, I already hate doing this. Okay, no, that's that's fine. Now, look, these remaining games over here, though, are basically completely different stories, and they have nothing to do with one another. So that, well, a except maybe the PSP and Wii, because those were made by Ubisoft Quebec, and they both have fairies or, or jins. Oh, fuck, fuck. Oh god, 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 shit. Fuck. Okay, look, the DS version is actually completely separate. This seemingly has no ties to any other narrative and revolves around a satanic Satan cult that wants to murder the prince and use his blood. This is the DS game. Why does it have the most darkest and fucked up story? Okay, let's 
let's just focus back on the HD version, shall we? I recorded this footage on my 360 because I couldn't log into Uplay to play the version that's on Steam. Thank you, Ubisoft. We're going to be diving the deepest on this one, since this is likely the most popular loser of the bunch that most of none of you have probably not played. The prince wanders into a castle his apparently existing brother Malik is currently occupying. There was never any mention of mystery brothers in the first three games, but I guess this is where some of that movie inspiration comes from, because Christ only knows there's a whole slipknot's worth of family members running around in the film. There is an invading army breaking down the front gates. The prince arrives in the nick of time, but Malik is crazy intent on releasing some uh, unbeatable super death army that's locked away in the old vaults of Solomon, the original founder of the castle. The prince is wary of this because... I'm not trying to question your leadership. You don't even know what you're releasing. As many warriors as the grains of desert sand. Yeah. But eventually he just says fuck it and, you know, let's just get on with the plot. They let loose this army of But in doing so, this for some reason also frees Diablo. Well, not the big D himself, but a blandly evil fire spirit named Ifrit. Uh okay, I don't I don't know. Oh shit, Prince, you let loose another ancient evil again, which you seem to do all the time a lot. Guess you better jump and stab stuff till it goes away. Man, this all sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Along the way, you meet a nice gin girl whose name is Riza the Riza, uh, who, who dolls out your new magical powers, which include the control of the elements, freezing water, using gusts of wind, that sort of thing. You only meet the Riza when you need a new ability, so for most of the game you're a lonely prince boy who occasionally meets up with Malik again who's slowly going nuts every few hours in between lots of bland platforming and kind of repetitive combat. Right, the combat, which would be completely redesigned yet again. This time, it's more akin to a Musou game with the prince mowing down tons and tons of with a few heavies mixed in every wave or two. There are some entertaining sequences here, like jumping from enemy to enemy onto their shoulders, and there's some neat looking spells that can crowd clear, but the combat never elevates itself into anything really memorable. What's even less memorable is the platforming, which, as we know, is the bulk of what you do in pop games. Again, there's nothing particularly exciting or even challenging here. In fact, only once after you've gotten the final power does the game start throwing fun rooms that challenge you to multitask with everything you've learned and then BAM! Final boss! Just as it started to click its few new ideas into something worthwhile, it's all over. After that, there's not much else to do. Combat survival waves and some unlockable skins, but I don't have any particular desire to play through this again. I remember being pretty unimpressed back when it released, so my apathy is now at an all-time high or, or low or whatever. And that's the thing, there's nothing really wrong or bad here. The running and jumping is solid, but not spectacular. The level design is nicely detailed, but they're generic hallways and dungeons. And the story, since it's a weird prequel or spin-off, can't do anything unexpected or groundbreaking. It's almost as if they should have taken a bit more time with this game instead of rushing it to meet a movie release date. At the very least, I'm glad Ubisoft enjoyed massive success with the film and... Oh... Right, right. Okay, okay, well, Prince of Persia isn't the biggest video game blockbuster in the world. That title, of course, goes to Assassin's Creed! Yeah! Get on your hoodies! Hidden Blades live by the Creed! Oh, right, that, that was an even bigger failure. Moving on to something a bit more positive, we have the Wii version of Forgotten Sands, which, for my money, is a more satisfying experience overall, but it still comes with its own set of flaws and quibbles, as all of the titles we'll be covering today do. Here we are presented with a more colorful and fun Sands of Time-esque tale that has the prince following hot rumors from a fairy spirit that tells of a completely abandoned but glorious city in a hidden land that he could have all to himself. The prince here is depicted as a more swashbuckling rogue type who seeks adventure and glory and wants to carve out his own piece of ancient Persia. 
Unfortunately, before he can flip this new home and turn an easy profit, a nasty plant-based curse sprouts up once he pulls out an old sword that was embedded in a rock face. This then, of course, reawakens this gross plant witch and renews this ancient curse once more. If the prince wants this land for his own, he'll need to reforge the sword, kill the witch, and grind his teeth while he tolerates this new Navi-like companion, Zara, along the way. From the outset, you definitely get a different vibe from this game, almost like a long-lost Aladdin straight-to-video sequel you didn't even know existed. It focuses much on a new tempo of platforming, which uses the Wii pointer to manipulate certain objects and special powers the prince can utilize fairly early on, and unlike the HD version, starts challenging you from the outset to multitask all this stuff together. I actually find this to be some of the most satisfying gameplay in the entire series, as they play with a lot of neat perspective shifts, you always feel like you're doing something new. The flip side of the coin, however, is combat once again. Very unlike its HD brother, the prince now fights with no more than four enemies at once, and is usually locked in a room until the battle is over, which fortunately never takes too long. This is a good thing, as most of the melee strikes in this game are done via waggling. But a lot of the other functions are well thought out with parries, rolls, and the usage of spells that can make quick work of any plant-based goon if you know the right tactic. While it's not ideal and it takes some practice, Comet never really sours the experience as it takes a backseat to the platforming. What can sour some people is if you are used to the superlative animation that's been in every pop game, prepare yourself for some rough edges here, since this is one of the few titles in the series that did not have Ubisoft Montreal at the helm. Animations look a little bit wonky and basic to tell you the truth, and while not terrible by any stretch of the imagination, they just kind of pale in comparison to previous entries in the series. Something that also needs a bit of work is some of the dialogue and voice acting, usually most of everything coming out of Zara's face. This way, my prince. Do you like kisses, my prince? Who doesn't? Where are you? Kiss the statue, and you'll see. While I commend the slightly more adventurous and cartoon nature of this version, Zara pushes it a little too much into the Winx Club territory. Wrapping up, there's even a bunch of great extras to unlock in this game, like the Super Nintendo version of Pop 1, more costumes, and a bevy of well-produced behind-the-scenes videos. While Forgotten Sands, we did get slightly better reviews from site aggregates than all the other versions, it still has its own wrinkles, and that lip-smacking air of a rushed and slightly undercooked game. I just prefer this smell, personally. It's almost as if they could have used more time to polish and tweak and not rush it to meet a movie's release date. And speaking of not polishing things, can someone explain why no one at Ubisoft saw fit to make sure the prince's design was consistent across the board for these games? Pictured here, we have the grimacing nephew of Ron Perlman, perhaps, maybe? And the ghostly beauty of a prince that's been possessed by the fucking Night King. Like, why are they so different? I sure hope uh, Jean-Francois was fired for that blunder. Oh, right, don't think we've forgotten about you, Forgotten Sans DS. I may not have much to say about you. Anyway, if you played or at least watched our last episode on Pop Zero, you'll know I wasn't much of a fan of Ubi's stylus-only handheld entry, The Fallen King. Sad to report, this is pretty much the exact same game with new levels and swaps out Nolan North for Yuri Lowenthal. Well, I mean, if these games had voice acting. So yeah, it's just tap, 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 uh, everything on screen. And while I do find the touch controls slightly more accurate in this version, they're not much more fun. The DS wasn't a graphical powerhouse, but it could do 2D sprite-based games well, which always look more appealing than this. Ah, uh, what could have been? A actually, Forgotten Sands DS, consider yourself forgotten. Last, but surprisingly, like, really surprisingly not least is the PSP version, because if you were a fan of the device at this time, you mostly got watered down ports on the consoles and we could just stop talking here. But no, Ubisoft Quebec handled this one as well, and instead of making an uglier, worsier thing that already existed, they went above and beyond and crafted a really nifty 2.5D side-scroller that shows a lot of the framework of the Wii iteration. 
It has a somewhat similar story with the prince helping out a magical time spirit named Halim, whose sisters have been enslaved by a vague evil force that I think is another fire demon, but a different fire demon from the Wii game. <sighs> Uh, as he rescues each one of these time sisters, he gains a new power, yada 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 yada. The story is actually one of the weaker elements with nice looking but almost incomprehensible cutscenes peppered minimally throughout the short quest. It's unclear who the bad guy is for most of the narrative and you just basically do whatever Halim tells you from level to level. There are, however, lots of those, with the challenge ramping up considerably early on with a whole variety of traps and puzzles to solve. This version of the game also has a hook where you can flick the camera nub to different parts of the environment and speed up or speed down certain elements of the levels. Much like the Wii version, you better be good at managing lots of shit on your screen. Graphically, it looks like a slightly downgraded Wii version and even has identical prints models, so there's definitely a lot of asset reuse here. Combat even works generally the same, but thankfully no waggle for your basic combos, so an improvement. Boss battles, yeah, they're another matter as some of them come across as limited and even a bit frustrating in their design, but nothing too egregious. Still though, this is a charming little game in the series, and in my opinion, easily the best handheld title in the entire franchise. If you happen to own this ancient video gramophone called the VTA, you can play Forgotten Sands on it for cheap. Give it a try, it may surprise you. Finally, we have the Gamecom version. No, 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 we are, we are done with Forgotten Sands now, I, I promise. Actually, we've almost reached the top of the Palace of Persia in general, but of course, there's still some unfinished business. Stay tuned next week for our final episode, where we touch upon some of the obscure bits and bobs and see what the future holds for this eclectic franchise. Hopefully, it's more than nothing. Please? Please let there be something next time on...